Hi, my name is Mariah and I'm, I'm an animal care specialist here at the Living Coast at the Brookfield Zoo. And I'm here today to talk to you about symbiosis on the reef. Symbiosis describes any relationship between two species and it can be described as either mutualistic, commensalistic, or parasitic. So I wanna to start today by talking about one of the most famous relationships on the reef, which are clownfish and anemones. So there are about 30 different species of clownfish in the wild. We have three species here at the Brookfield Zoo and two in this exhibit. The one that you see that is black up in the corner, that is an Ocellaris clownfish. It's most famously known as what Marlin and Nemo are in Finding Nemo. We do actually have an orange, white, and black one in a different exhibit, but we have the coloration of Ocellaris that are black up here. The other ones we have are our skunk clownfish. They are the orange with the white stripe on their back, and they're the ones you see up here in the anemone. Um, you can also see the one right there is actually tending to a nest. They have some eggs on the rock. It is bright pink, um, kind of orangish color back there. So that is pretty cool to see. Um, an interesting fact about clownfish is they are protandrous hermaphrodites. So clownfish all actually are born as males, and throughout their life, the biggest and most dominant uh, animal in the anemone will become the female. So you can see the female is kind of up at the top back there. She is significantly larger than the male clownfish. And as you see, they are all in anemones. Um, there are over a thousand different species of anemone in the world. And not all of them host clownfishes, and certain species of anemones host different species of clownfishes. Um, here we have a bubble tip anemone and they commonly host many different species of clownfish. So something interesting about anemones, which many people may know, is they sting. It's how they catch their prey. It's a unique adaptation. They're able to catch their prey in those tentacles they have and draw them into their oral cavity, which you can see in the middle. It's actually a mouth because jellyfish are animals. They are not plants. Um, so these clownfish and the anemones have a special relationship that is mutualistic which means they both benefit each other. The clownfish are able to secrete a special type of mucus within their skin that allows them to not be stung by the anemone. Um, so for them, the anemone offers protection, a nice place to live, <laughs> and that's very beneficial to them since they're able to tend to their nest, live right there. And for the anemone, they benefit from the clownfish because clownfish can be slightly territorial and they will scare off other predatory fish in the reef. Um, so, yeah, so you can see them there. So clownfish are not the only fish that we have or animals that we have that live in anemones. If you come and look down here, um, you can see our sexy shrimp. Are you able to see them? So we have a couple that are sitting on the algae so. back there, but they also commonly live in anemones. Yeah, they are right there. So similar to clownfish, the anemone will provide protection for the sexy shrimp. And sexy shrimp, oh, yep, there's one on the anemone right there. Sexy shrimp will kind of keep the area around the clownfish, or around the sexy shrimp. Oh, goodness, sorry. <laughs> the sexy shrimp will keep the area around the anemone kind of tidy and clean for it. Um, the reason sexy shrimp are called sexy shrimp, I don't know if you can see some of them. Um, it looks like the one up in this corner is doing it. But they kind of wag their backsides back and forth, and that's how they get their name. These guys are being a little bit <laughs> less, but every once in a while you see some good movement from them. Ooh. They're really cool. Um, how many do we have? There you know? are eight up here. I do like how they um, sometimes look like they're dancing. Yeah, they're really cool. They're very small. Yes, they're kind of hard to find, so you have to really look. Yeah, it's a little bit of a scavenger hunt in here, but um, usually if you look down, you'll be able to see them along the anemones and kind of right there in the algae. Um, so we actually also have two different species of anemone in this exhibit. The one that you see the sexy shrimp on right now are rock flower anemones. 
And then we also have a mini carpet anemone. So there are three of the species of anemone that we have here at the Living Coast. And how long do anemones live? So that's actually a kind of interesting question because the way anemones grow is sometimes they will split apart. So as far as age goes, it's kind of hard to tell because you know, when, okay. when they split, is it the same age as the original one? Would you consider that a new one? Um, you can see some small ones down here where this one has been multiplying. Very cool. Say anemone nine times fast. Oh, you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, I could try. I'll probably get a little tongue tied. All right. All right, what's next? All right. Ooh, we're tangled. Uh oh. So, <laughs> um, another relationship I would like to talk about is the relationship between corals, anemones, and a type of algae called zooxanthellae. So, once again, corals are related to anemones and jellyfish, and they are all animals. They are not plants. If you look really closely, so this is a fungia right here. It's kind of the green one with all the tentacles coming out. Mm -hmm. If you look in the center where it's purple, that is actually its mouth. And you can see it in a couple different types of corals if you look closely. Um, maybe hard to tell just because of the lighting in this tank, but this is a blastomusa right here. It has the kind of reddish purple outside, the green inside. You can see some of the mouths are open in those polyps. So, zooxanthellae is a type of algae and it's actually a dinoflagellate, which is a single-celled organism. So what do corals do for the zooxanthellae? They provide protection, just like anemones and jellyfish, those tentacles do sting. Most corals do, they have tentacles that can kind of retract at night or at various times in the day. They use those to catch food and that provides protection for the zooxanthellae. And how do the, the zooxanthellae benefit the coral? They actually use sunlight to create excess sugars that can be utilized by the coral to improve growth and for their survival. Uh, we actually have special lighting here, which allows, um, it closely mimics sunlight and it's actually very hard for light to penetrate water, so they're super powerful. And we use that light to feed the zooxanthellae that helps in turn provide nutrition for our corals. How large can an anem <laughs> anemones, <laughs> anemones get? <laughs> um, they can actually get pretty huge. I mean, I've been scuba diving and I feel like I've been over things that are larger than my body. Um, they also kind of grow into the space that they have, so the, our corals that we have here won't necessarily become the size of a human, but corals can get very, very large. Hmm. Uh, do they sting as well? Yes, they do. So, like, if you were to touch, um, the thing, the interesting thing about corals, and you can see this on a reef, is if corals get too close to each other, they'll start stinging each other because that is something they use for their own protection to kind of have out their own space. Um, I'm sure many people have heard of fire coral. That's a coral that's known for having a particularly um, potent sting to humans. Some of this stuff I may not feel, but a fish, something that is a prey item it's trying to catch, that will sting. Corals do, can eat things like fish. Um, every once in a while, some of these bigger things, we will cut them up a small piece of capelin and they can eat them. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And then something else with the relationship with the zooxanthellae is you may have heard of the issue of coral bleaching. When corals are stressed, they can actually expel the zooxanthellae, which leaves them very white in color and often leads to the coral's death. Um, so we just wanted to take a minute to talk about, there's a number of potential causes for this. One of the largest they believe is climate change, is the ocean's warming. It's causing a lot of stresses on corals. Um, but there's even smaller things that people could do in their day-to-day -day lives to benefit corals. Um, one of those is if you are ever at the beach to try to find sunscreen that is coral safe, reef safe, environmentally safe. Um, it's one of the little things you can do to try to protect our coral reefs because they are a very fascinating place of diversity on our planet. Uh, lots of people are asking when the building is going to open and I believe uh, we're posting all of our building openings on our website as well as Facebook. So if you guys just want to keep an eye on that, um, then you'll know. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Can you grow coral at home? 
Um, yes, you can. Uh, a lot of people do it. It's actually another really cool conservation thing is people are trying to have aquarium grown corals. Um, a lot of it actually has to do with how corals grow. You can get fragments. Um, a lot of them will break and split and you can grow new corals from the frags. Um, so that is something you can do at home. Some corals are easier to do that with. Some are more difficult. Um, certain ones are really awesome. Like we have some mushrooms up here that are pretty easy to get new ones at home. Um, but there are other corals that are incredibly difficult and do not do the best. How many different types of coral are here at the Living Coast? There's more than I can even count. We have many different types. Um, hang on, I'm just scrolling through all of your questions. Do you know how many varieties of coral exist? There are thousands. Thousands. That's cool. Um, what temperature do you keep the water at? So all of our tanks are gonna, or all of our aquariums are gonna vary a little bit, um, but as far as most of our reef exhibits, they are around 76 to 78 degrees. So that's nice and warm. How do you keep all of these aquariums so clean? <laughs> a lot of scrubbing. <laughs> a lot, a lot of scrubbing. Um, our lights, as I said, we need them very powerful so they can promote the good kind of algae within the coral and the aquarium to grow. But that also means a lot of other algae that just likes to grow on the windows due to the lighting comes out quite a bit. So every morning we come in here, we scrub that away and make sure everybody has a pleasant viewing experience of our animals. Out of all of the fish and coral and anemones that are up here in this front area, which is your favorite? My favorite? Um, we don't have an exhibit of my, or an example of my favorite coral up here. They're, um, they're called trachophilias and lobophilias. If anybody does happen to know what they are, they, um, they're just really beautiful. But my favorite fish is up here, which is our powder blue tang. Um, it's that blue and yellow guy that may go hide right there. So those are actually closely related to the blue tangs that everybody knows as dory. They are part of the surgeon fish family, or tangs. That yellow tang down there, the bright yellow fish, is also a tang, which is in the same family. Cool. All right, so I have a couple other things to show you guys. So over here, we actually have our upside down jellyfish. They are also have a special relationship with zooxanthellae. Why are they called upside down jellyfish? So it's because we jokingly call it, they face sunny side up. Most oh. jellyfish, <laughs> like the bell would be up towards like the light. Whereas this, it's their tentacles and their underside that are going towards the light. Um, ah. So xanthelia is actually found all throughout these jellyfish. It's kind of what gives them the brownish color that they have. Um, but they're also especially concentrated in those vesicles that kind of look maybe blue or purple, depending on how you see it on there. Oh, okay. Um, part of the reason, as we kind of mentioned, these jellyfish are upside down is in order to feed this, uh, the zooxanthellae, which are in them. Do and these, do, do, oh, I'm sorry. Do the upside down jellyfish sting? Uh, they do. All jellyfish do. So oh, all jellyfish, jellyfish yeah. anemones, and corals are all cnidarians, which part of that is characterized by the nematocytes they have, which are the stinging cells. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so that's how they're all closely related. And why the corals and anemones are considered animals with the jellyfish. Okay. Okay. So that's another symbiotic relationship where they both benefit mutually because the jellyfish get some sugar and energy from the zooxanthellae while the jellyfish provide protection. So we have a couple other little things up here we wanted to show you to discuss the symbiotic relationships, which you may see on a coral reef. So these are molts for cleaner shrimp, and I'm sorry, they're a little bit old and brittle. We do not have any cleaner shrimp up here, but we do have them in the building. So there are actually a number of different types of cleaner organisms. Um, several are fish species, some are shrimp. And they actually set up cleaning stations around coral reefs. Um, they will actually eat parasites and loose scales off their clients. 
Oh, yum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, helping keep the wreath healthy. In return, they get a source of nutrition. Um, it's actually really cool because if you were to go online, there's actually videos of <laughs> like cleaner shrimp and cleaner rafts who will go and clean divers' teeth if they manage to find a cleaning station while scuba diving near a reef. Yeah, I know. It's No, thank you. It's, it's different. <laughs> um, but it's also really fun having these guys here because when we go to service one of our exhibits, they will often kind of jump on our, our hands and give us a little cleaning too while we're cleaning the windows or doing feeds. Um, so it's incredibly fascinating how all the species in the reef work together to keep each other healthy. And um, we also, in this building, have some cleaner wrasse, which are another one of those species that you often find in the cleaning stations on the reef. And just for people who don't know, so these are molts. So the way shrimp grow is they uh, actually lose their exoskeleton in their outer layer. Wait, so we're yeah, still that's over here. Sorry, I got too um, excited. No, 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 that's okay. So it's kind of similar to some other crustaceans you may have heard of where the outer shell will come out. Um, the one scary thing about this, when they do molt, that is actually when the animal is most vulnerable because it takes a while for that outer layer to harden again, um, as this is what helps protect them. But it's kind of cool because every once in a while we do come in and find their molt. The animal is still there, but sometimes, especially when they're fresh, they look exactly like them. You can still see the stripe. Um, cleaner shrimp usually have that red stripe on their back. so. Really. It's kind of cool that you're able to see that. So I do have one more example of a symbiotic relationship, and this is actually a parasitism. So this is an isopod. Are you able to see that? Yeah, I can see it. Um, they're actually related to those roly polies or pill bugs you may find in your house. So you do find parasites on fish, and this is actually beneficial to the parasite but it harms the fish, which explains that relationship. Not all symbiotic relationships are good for everybody in this situation. Um, so isopods will often attach themselves to the fish and kind of slowly eat away at the fish, which obviously harms the fish, and they can grab kind of scraps of food as they come out of them too. Um, so we just wanted to show you an example of something different. Here at the Living Coast, we try to work with our wonderful vet staff to make sure that our fish are parasite free. <laughs> Yeah, that would be no fun. No, but it, it is something that happens, and um, those of us who work here kind of think all things found in the ocean are very unique and interesting, so <laughs> yeah. we did want to show you yeah. something, because this is pretty cool. Um, someone was asking how jellyfish reproduce, and Mike actually did a really, really good uh, video on that yes. a couple months ago, so we'll post that in the comments so you don't have to, because okay, yeah. it's quite a process. Yes. What other questions does everybody have? Oh, how old do you have to be to volunteer or work at Brookfield Zoo? I think it's, what is it? That 18? is a great question. 16, 18? Um, depends on where you are at. Yeah, it depends on where you yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Check the website. It has all the information about that that you need. Um, let's see. And these are all saltwater um, animals, right? Correct. Everything we looked at today are saltwater. And what other types of fish can you find in the Living Coast? Uh, we have a bunch of different fish. It ranges everything from the guys you see up here. We have some freshwater fish. We have our, um, our sharks and rays, which are our elasmobranchs. We have, we've got a lot for people to see. <laughs> Any sea turtles? Uh, we do have a sea turtle, but she is a reptile, so that is why I did not include pistachio. I know I did see fish, but we do love but pistachio. Yes, we love her. Here. We're very excited for everybody to come and meet her and fall in love with her, just the way all of the animal care staff has. <laughs> um, what types of predators would? Uh, the question specifically asks about jellyfish, but let's mm -hmm. open it up to, um, you know, the, the other, the coral and anemone. Mm -hmm. So um, just in general, fish are often predators to them. Um, for example, butterfly fish really love to eat coral and anemones. So that's kind of how the um, clownfish provide protection for the uh, anemone is they kind of are territorial around their home and they will scare some fish away. 
And what do jellyfish eat? Um, so it varies depending on the type of jellyfish. The jellyfish we have here, one of them are moon jellies. Those guys eat uh, baby brine shrimp, which is called nopliae, um, Artemia nopliae. Uh, it's something that we hatch here every day and feed them. The upside down jellies, we also give them some of that nopliae, but at the same time, light is one of their biggest food sources because of that zooxanthellae algae that they have growing within them. Are there any freshwater coral or anemone? Not that I am aware of. That was a good question. There, there are freshwater plants, um, but there are no corals that I'm aware of. All right, thank you so much for tuning in today, and we are really excited to have everyone back at the Brookfield Zoo and look forward to welcoming you back to the Living Coast when we can.